Hello, everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you so much for joining us for this year's online version of DGC Visionaries. Over the past year, DGC Visionaries has become a must attend event at many of our top film festivals, bringing together some of the most interesting filmmakers with films at the fests. This year, we are taking Visionaries online and sharing it clear across the country highlighting as many brilliant filmmakers coast to coast as we can. All DGC Visionary sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the DGC National YouTube channel. I'm thrilled and honored to be here with these guests. We're speaking with award-winning and TIFF 2020 Emerging Talent uh, recipient, director Tracy Deer, about her buzzworthy film, Beans which currently has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 100%. I'm not sure if she knows that, I just looked it up. It's 100% at the moment. Beans is having its premiere at TIFF and is also playing VIF before heading off to more international festivals and release. I cannot think of anyone better to lead this conversation than Jason Ryle. Jason is Anishinaabe from Lake St. Martin, Manitoba and works as a producer, programmer, curator and arts consultant based in Toronto. From July 2010 to June 2020, Jason was the executive director of Imaginative, an Indigenous-run organization mandated to support Indigenous screen content creators. In this capacity, Jason oversaw all operational and artistic activities of the annual Anima Ima Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival and the organization's year-round activities, including international partnerships and special projects. Since 2006, Jason has been a script reader for the Harold Greenberg Fund and currently serves as the chair of the Toronto Arts Council's Video, Visual and Media Arts Committee. From 2013 until 2020, he was an advisor for Indigenous films at the Berlinale. Jason has produced two short animations and is currently in development as a producer on three feature films, one short and one documentary feature. And I'm thrilled to introduce our featured director, Mohawk filmmaker Tracy Deer, led the acclaimed dramedy Mohawk Girls, produced by Resolution Pictures to five award-winning seasons as its co-creator, director, and co-showrunner. She's worked with the CBC, the National Film Board, and numerous independent production companies in both documentary and fiction. She was nominated four years in a row for a Canadian Screen Award for Best Direction in a Comedy Series for Mohawk Girls, and has been honored at TIFF with the Burke's Diamond Tribute Award. Tracy recently completed this film, Beans, uh, a coming of age story about a young Mohawk girl's experiences during the Oka crisis, a 1990 land dispute between the Mohawk and their Francophone neighbors in Quebec. It has been selected for the DGC Discovery Award, TIFF Next Wave section at TIFF 2020, She's also the recipient of this year's Emerging Talent Award, presented by L'Oreal Paris and supported by MGM. Tracy began production on Beans right after returning from LA, where she was a writing co-EP on season three of the hit Netflix CBC series, Anne with an E, working alongside showrunner Moira Wally, Wally Beckett, uh, Emmy winner for Breaking Bad. Tracy wrote one episode of Anne with an E and co-wrote a second. Her projects and development include a documentary with the NFB about the practicalities of, of achieving reconciliation and forgiveness and Inner City Girl, a feature about Aboriginal gang life with original pictures. Tracy strongly believes in giving back to the community. She chairs the board of Directors of Women in View, a nonprofit that promotes greater diversity and balance in Canadian media from the standpoint of employment equity, creative authority, and gender representation. She has mentored emerging talent as leader of the director training program at Imaginative. Uh, and she's also been a guest mentor at the National Screen Institute New Indigenous Voices program and a directing mentor for NSI's new Indigidox training course. I'd like to heartily welcome Tracy Deer and Jason Ryle. Come on in. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Good to have you both here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Hans. Before I hand it over to Tracy and Jason, uh, I just want to point our viewers to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's where you can type your questions in 
uh, throughout the conversation. Jason will be watching as they come in and he will uh, pick and choose what he can from those questions uh, to ask during the conversation. He may not be able to get to them all, but he will try. Throw them in there whenever a question comes to mind and we'll try to get them in. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, Jason, Tracy, really looking forward to this conversation. It's an amazing film. Congratulations again on that. And uh, I will see you both at the end. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. It's a pleasure to be doing this again for the DGC. And hello, Tracy. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. Uh, we've known each other for a very long time. Oh my God. I mean, I've been in the business 20 years and my first film premiered at Imaginative. The first award I ever won was at Imaginative. It was the moment I felt like I'm a real filmmaker. Uh, and that was about 15 years ago. 15 so years ago. Yeah, it was coming up 15 years. It was 2005. Uh, it was Mohawk Girls. Yeah, I remember Mohawk Girls. almost any, almost everything about that time. Um, but what a time. I mean, my God, how things can change in 15 years. Um, you know, and I'm no longer with Imaginative, of course, so one tends to be a little um, introspective about that time period. And it's easy to get emotional when you think about those early years and our hopes and dreams for each other and for the industry and to see where we're at currently. And we're here currently, of course, to talk about your latest project, Beans, which is having its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank How you exciting, so much. Exciting, exciting. Uh, and I thought before you know, we kick off the conversation, we'll kick off the conversation by playing the trailer, just so those who haven't seen it can get a taste um, of the fabulous Beans. So uh, Ryan, if we can play the trailer, please. My name is Tikahandakwa. Or you can call me Beans. Everybody does. This is our road! Our road! If you can't feel pain, no one can hurt you. Ah! Fabulous. And, you know, I was really trying to think about where we could start with this conversation, because I think there's so many points of entries to it. But, um, you know, we're here currently, well, I'm in Toronto, you're back home in Ganawage, uh, but you were here in Toronto. And I think, you know, perhaps I know the journey for the film is just starting, but I know you've been so incredibly busy this past week doing interviews, promoting the film everything about that. I've heard you on the radio, I've heard you on TV, read you in print. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you feeling? Oh, uh, it's a really complicated question because there's, it's, and I, it's complicated because I don't know that there are words. Um, you know, I'm living my dream right now. Uh, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker and here I am being a filmmaker, but I'm, it's not, I'm not just, putting a film out. Um, it's a film that is very, very personal. It's also a film that now has been very widely well received. A lot of reviews have been written and people have seen the movie and they're talking about it and everything I had hoped the film could, everything I hoped for the film, the type of impact it could have on somebody emotionally. The news is coming in that that's happening. So that's a whole nother level. Um, I got this Emerging Talent Award. Uh, the award was given to me by Ava DuVernay, who is just like an incredible idol. So it's, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, is this happening or am I asleep? <laughs> and I'm dreaming about what I hope will happen when we premiere a TIFF. So I, I think I'm awake, right? Yeah, I'd say your, you dreams are right very, uh, your dreams are very powerful because I'm in them too. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. 
but it's wonderful. It's so wonderful to hear you say that, Tracy. Yeah, I mean, the reviews have been phenomenal. I mean, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, IndieWire, I mean, they're really coming back and really seem to be catching, uh, you know, what you're putting out there. They're really sort of like, you know, talking about the major points of the story, why it's important and why this film is unique. So let's go back to the very beginning. I love, love, love hearing directors' origin stories. And I know that yours goes back all the way to when you were 12, to the incidents at the uprising um, that happened in your territory. Um, and you decided then and there during this time that you were going to be a filmmaker. Can you talk, I mean, that just, that's so beautiful and so powerful. And I just want to hear you expand on that some more. Absolutely. So, you know, when I was 12, that was when the, the portable VHS machines came on the market. So it was the first time we were able to watch movies in our home. And these VHS machines were so expensive. I mean, you couldn't own one. But our local video store in Ganawage had two that you could rent. My father was an iron worker, so we had a little bit of cash for this type of splurge. And so every weekend, my dad would rent a v like this massive VHS machine. And he'd rent a pile of movies, maybe 15 movies every weekend. Um, and in the beginning, the whole family would sit down and that's all we would do is we would watch movies. After a little while, my sister got a little bored. She'd watch maybe one or two movies. My mother as well would go on to other things. But me and my father, we would just watch movie after movie after movie. And for me, it was a chance to, to go to explore the world and explore my feelings. And especially after the Oka crisis, um, there were so many complicated feelings. And, you know, growing up Mohawk, the message I definitely received, one, much like the journey Beans has to go on, you know, you need to be tough. That is a part of what it is to be Mohawk. And a lot of that, the message I got was that's connected to your emotions. You, you cannot show weakness and our emotions are our weakness. So, and I'm a very, I've always been a very, very sensitive kid. I'm a very sensitive woman. And so I worked really hard to keep all of that in. And the one place that I was free and safe to let them out was when I would watch movies. Mm -hmm. So I would get, I would be able to feel anger for the character, what the character was going through. I was able to let it out. If, if I wanted to cry for myself, I could do it with the character. I was, I felt like that didn't impede my toughness as a Mohawk woman. Now, of course, fast forward, I realized that our emotions are actually what makes us human. My sensitivity to those emotions is what makes me the director I am. So I'm really glad I found my way out of that messaging. But I would say that movies and storytelling um, will, it, 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 it saved me during that period of time. And after every movie, I was so inspired by something I'd seen that I thought, oh, I, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I mean, I was a chit, I was a kid. I want to be that. I want to be that. I want to be that. Um, and after a couple months, I realized it just sort of hit me that, oh my God, if I made movies, I could experience all of these stories. I may put something out there that might inspire some little girl out there watching to then become the doctor that cures cancer. And what could be better than that? So it, it just dawned on me that this is what I want to do. And, and not long after, I mean, I started writing scripts. I also started renting the big giant video cameras from the local video store um, and bossing all the neighborhood kids around. And it was then I thought one day I'm going to make a story about the Oka crisis, but from our point of view, because the way I lived it was very different than the way I think anyone else lived it. And it had such a profound and destructive effect on me and uh, my place in the world as an Indigenous woman. Oh my God, absolutely. And we're going to get to um, the actual crisis itself in a minute. But I'm, I'm curious, I want to know more about who, I guess it's, it's maybe two, two parts to this question. Who were your cinematic heroes at the time? And or where did you find or see inspiration from our 
cinematic heroes from people within our community? So there were none. I, I didn't have any from our community at that age. I would say it was Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were, were the films that I was watching and just the, my eyes going wide. Um, I did not, I did not, definitely did not think it was possible to, to I wanted to become a filmmaker, but I never thought I'd be able to tell our stories. They just weren't there. So I thought I would grow up and I would go to Hollywood and I would blow shit up just like they do. And I'd have a blast. Um, and it was only, again, I had grad, I was graduating from university. I came back to Montreal for a summer before sort of making the leap into, cause I went to school in the States. So I knew the American system. I came back for the summer and then I was going to move to New York city. And it was while I was here for that summer that, uh, APTN had just launched and a production company resolution pictures in Montreal was setting off to make a feature documentary and they were looking to have an indigenous production assistant on board they called the newspaper on my reserve to just randomly ask do you know anyone luckily my cousin worked in that office because the editor was like okay somebody's calling they're looking for this and my cousin was like oh oh, oh tracy dear she just graduated she wants to be a filmmaker so i went in i interviewed after two hours of just talking about film I got offered the job and I never left for the States. Uh, thank God for cousins. I mean, they <laughs> saved, yes. saved thank the God day. for the hundreds of cousins. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Saved the day and changing life paths every day. <laughs> uh, that, that's really phenomenal. I mean, and that's the thing. That's there was movie. just, you know, there wasn't access to our filmmakers, those filmmakers who were actually able to make films at that time. Uh, and certainly, you know, there wasn't a depth that we're seeing today of the kinds of stories that were existing there. And um, again, we'll talk about that in a second specifically. But, um, you know, when, I'm, when I saw Beans and thinking about that time, I mean, so many, there's so many layers to it. But one of them that always kept on popping up and just hearing you speak now in the, you know, the past 15 minutes that we've been chatting, I mean, legacy always comes to mind. And you know, what's so extraordinary and so beautiful, I mean, three, I'll show you an anecdote, three years ago, I was at a conference on indigenous futurisms at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And there were these two young men, I forget their names, but they were the ones who uh, launched the Red Rising magazine in Manitoba and early 20s. And there was a young uh, Hawaiian uh, teenager who was in game development. And something just so profound about their presentations really struck me. There's something very profound about what they were presenting. And it took me a while to unpack it. And I realized it was the first time that I was hearing a cohort, a generation, speak from a point of view that grew up with role models in oh my God. so many different forms of media. And the way that they were interacting with and connecting with culture and ideas and art was just so extraordinary. And it was so beautiful. It was really like, it was emotional. I'm, I'm going to cry. I mean, that sounds okay. That it was, it was amazing. really powerful. But Tracy, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I think of everything that you and your cohort has, has done and has achieved. I mean, that's precisely what you've created here. You're creating a legacy, a body of work that my nieces, that your nieces and nephews, are growing up within and it's changing things so profoundly. So congratulations to you for that. Um, that is so kind to Jason, thank you. And Tracy, I know I've heard your interviews in the past week and I've seen the film of course, and um, I know how important um, this film is, Beans, uh, to you and to your life and to your community, your nation. Um, and I know that there are really emotional uh, and traumatic bits here. So I just want to say if there's anything that you're just tired of talking about, stop me. I'll try to contextualize <laughs> and frame things in a way. Um, but I mean, kudos to you and your strength um, for the past week for having to revisit those moments so often. <laughs> um, and I know the power of film is, is healing and inspirational to so many. So um, I want to thank you for that as well. Hey, um, bring it on. Bring it on. So I need to take <laughs> a drink of water. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take that The water is coming I'm, out I'm of my eyes. The, oh, the water is coming <laughs> out of my eyes for some reason. Um, so, I mean, 
Oka, what a transformative moment for so many people. You're born a day after me, a few years later, but a day after me. I'm born on February 27th, so I get the Pisces uh, sensitivity, absolutely. But do you know, Oka was such a turning point for so many people. And I'll share with you sort of like my memories of it at the time too. And just how, I mean, it was such a massive pivot point. I remember being in the backseat of our car and my mom was driving. We were just driving into Winnipeg from the res. And there was a news report about Oka and it was clearly just really one-sided as the reports about that incident off, you know, at the time of the uprising were really at the time. And my mom said for the first time, I remember hearing her in her life, something political like you know she really said she says i wish i was there so i could stand with them and that just really (laughs) it really surprised me um you know and it was just such a moment where it really turned on a lot of things for me and made me sort of open my eyes in a different way and not i mean contextualized her for me in a historical context that i just never really saw before so being, I mean, we've seen so much about Oka. We've, we live through the news reports, many of us. Uh, you know, we've seen Alan East's remarkable uh, four documentaries on the uprising. Uh, it's been contextualized now, it's 30 years, you know, in the past, uh, but never have we seen a story like Beans, which is, you know, it, it is a coming of age story, but one unlike any that we've seen before, because it's told from the inside and it's told from a very unique, perspective. Um, So you've framed kind of the, you know, your origin as a filmmaker for Beans. And, you know, here we are 30 years later. And in a way, it's these these really powerful, strong bookends to a beginning and to not an end point, but to another pivot point, just like the uprising was. Um, You know, Beans, I I want you to kind of dive into Beans a little bit further and, and talk about sort of We'll start off like by talking about, I think, where, how you see Beans impacting or, or what you want Beans to say and how you want people to interact with, with the actual film. Sure. So you've seen the film. Um, there's, there's many, many themes running through. There's many layers to it. But for me, the, the key takeaway that uh, I hope audiences get is just how destructive these kinds of events, as well as racism, injustice, indifference, um, how destru- at, at anti-Indigenous racism, how destructive uh, that can be on a young person, and how it can completely derail um, and impact the course of their life before their life even begins. Um, I consider myself so lucky to have course corrected in my adolescence, but it was a very, very dark adolescence because of what I had lived through. And we need, we need a society where our kids feel like their dreams are possible. I certainly did not think my dreams were possible. And it's my tenacious warrior spirit of of being a Mohawk woman that just kept me going at it because nobody's going to tell me no, but not everybody has that ferocity sort of just, well, (laughs) it's built into me because I have all these incredible powerhouse women around me who, who taught me that. Um, So I just, we see, we see all the time. We just see our kids, Um, The spark fades, you know, the hope fades, the ambition fades. And it's because our society is still so hostile towards our people, towards our young people. So I, if there's anything, that's what I hope people take from the film is that our our kids need, need the world to change and the way for the world to change. It's not on us. We We are doing what we can, but the world is in the hands of other people and they need to step up and make things better. And I I hope that they fall in love with Beans and by the end, they want to do what they can to help her and kids like her. 
Yes, and you know that really makes me think of well, it makes a few things here. Let me let me narrow my rein my thoughts in here. One one of the things that I think really struck me about watching these films and and you know the perspective that it's told from these are young actors and phenomenal Gawain Dio, the lead who plays Beans, a phenomenal phenomenal performance and across the board the actress who plays her young sister and her friend April, tremendous actors. We can talk about them in a sec. But as a director, how did you prepare these young actors who, some are Mohawk, um, who didn't live, who weren't even born at the time of the uprising, but certainly who live with the legacy today? I'm curious to hear about sort of how you directed them to be in that moment, to understand that time. Um, and also if you saw something different through them, through your direction of them at that time? Ooh, there, there you go. I mean, that's a question I have not been asked. So good job. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the casting process was long. Um, we did a national search to find the kids first and foremost. And once we did narrow down to a short list, it was at that point that I I communicated with all of the parents. We had a short list of about 22 kids for all four roles. And I personally spoke to the parents and told them what the project was about. Because at that point, you know, when you're auditioning, kids across the country get two scenes and they, they audition and you don't have more information than that. So at this point, um, I told them all about what, the pro about what the project was. And of course, all of these parents knew the Oka crisis. Um, and we sent them the script. I wanted the parents to read the script and understand what we were going to be doing. And I told them if, if they were not comfortable, then do not let their child read it. Like, you know, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, but if they, if they were comfortable, then it would be up to them to decide what parts of the script their child read. I mean, there's some parts that are younger, especially the 10 year old who was, who was in the movie. Um, I didn't think it was appropriate for her to read those scenes. So, and her mother agreed. So, you know, they let her read certain parts. Um, and then we, we had another call in case there were questions. And like now that they had time to think about it, if they had any questions before going into the next phase of auditions, everybody was on board, everybody wanted to continue. And we did a two day workshop in Toronto with all the kids. And then we did another audition, another set of auditions. Um, when it came time to choosing, choosing the kids that I really felt really embodied the roles, there was more conversations with their parents where I, I went into more details about how I would be shooting these more difficult scenes in order to protect them as much as possible. Because the last thing I wanted was anybody to be traumatized in the recreation of this you know it's it's not worth it if we are hurt in the making of it so how do i how do i accomplish this how do i how do i recreate these terrible moments but we we all have a good time doing it and we're, we we all leave the set intact and okay so we had i had a very very detailed specific shooting plan and um, and I and with Gaudio specifically, I visited her. I really spoke to her about what it means to star in a film that you are in every single scene. And you know, when my co-writer and I, Meredith Lushnik, wrote the script, it's one thing to write a script where the the, the main character is in every scene. It was then once we went into pre-production that I looked at the script and was like, oh my god, she's in every single scene, like this is massive and it's a 12 year old. Um, so I spoke at depth at length with Gawadio and really just to make sure she really understood what she's getting into because once that train starts, there's no stopping the train. And this incredible brave young woman said, I'm ready, let's do it. And her parents were behind her as well. For every massive scene we went into um, on the day, or on the day or leading up to the day, there was some talk. We, we talked about feelings a lot. We talked about how we're feeling. Um, we had an acting coach with us who was there to help them manage their feelings as actors would to be 
to be your individual self this moment and then the process of getting into character so that the two that they didn't become muddied you know Gawadio didn't bring Gawadio into a scene she walked into a scene as beans and when she walked out our acting coach was there to then have beans leave beans aside and come back to who Gawadio is um, and I thought that was really, really, really important. And I'm really, really proud of, of that. Um, you know, the kids, they, they all, they've all grown up hearing about the Elka crisis to varying degrees. Once, once they were offered these roles or once we got really close to the, uh, the end of, of the audition process, they all sought out material. They were watching do do Ele Elenice's documentaries. So when I was on the phone with them, they would talk to me about, you know, what they'd learned um, that they saw the film, that they saw the films, they they have an understanding of what it is. They really, really want to be a part of telling the story. They really think it's important that that their generation hear it. Um, they were all so enthusiastic, so proud to be a part of bringing this history to life. So, so the the the, the, the vibes were very positive, and we were all um, like very empowered in what we were doing together. Does that I'm, answer your question? Oh, gotcha. I'm really happy to hear that. Okay. I, mean, I was really curious about, about that. I mean, how do they interact with the legacy? I mean, such, such, such a pivotal, such an important, such a, a, you know, fraught, complicated, powerful time in their nation's history and also for other Indigenous people in Canada's history. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear that they, they came out of that with a feeling of empowerment. And again, here too, I mean, it's this lovely interpretation their, through their performances, through your direction, through your writing and the film, um, to again, really bring that empowerment to a whole new generation and more. Um, on, on the topic of legacy too, I mean, we're talking about mothers, putting their, the parents involved in the actual performances. Uh, let's show a clip, um, which is actually one of my favorite scenes in the film itself. So why don't we, uh, I'll ask you to set up the clip and uh, Ryan will play it once you set it up. Sure thing. So we're about to see a scene um, somewhere, in, it's from the middle of the film. And uh, Beans, her little sister and her mother are heading to the barricade. They're bringing lunch to the men and women and children who happen to be there. Uh, and they come upon um, um, a highly charged moment. I'll leave it at that. We'll let the We'll let the clip speak for the rest of it. very short but very powerful scene and I'd love to hear you talk Tracy in terms of um, how I mean what you remember of the matriarchy of the women at that time um, and how they really impacted you um, and uh, and your your I guess your memory your remembrance of that time or how did that kind of give you strength going forward well so it's such an interesting question because you know, it's, it's, it's pre-crisis, it's post-crisis. It's my mother and my aunties and their friends being the leaders they are, but, but always, you know? So, uh, you know, my, in my household, my, my, mom, my mom's the boss. Uh, my aunties are the bosses. So, it, so when the Oka crisis is going on and the women are doing what they do, that was that was like yeah that it that's what they do so it it was really just it's just a natural flow and there it certainly was not a, it was not a surprise or it was not a like oh look what's happening it was like yeah that's that's what we do we we lead we take care we we handle shit so um 
I've had that question a few times now um, about how female positive the the film is and and you know was that a conscious choice and like why did you decide and um, the answer is just like that's the way it is so th the choice was was more uh, just about what what is the the truth of my experience and the truth of my experience is that um, the Mohawk women in my community are kick ass powerhouses. So that's that's where the story went. In your uh, acceptance speech last night, Tracy, for the Emerging Talent Award, you acknowledged your mother, which was very beautiful. Um, what has she said about the film that surprised you? So my mom saw it for the first time on Sunday, as did my, my little sister was there, my, my two teenage nieces, my husband, my aunt came. Um, and they all saw it for the first time in the theater at the premiere. And, you know, when I find, when I did greet them, because I had to do the Q&A afterwards and they had to leave the theater. And so when I did find them outside the theater, um, my eyes, my mom's eyes were still glossy. Uh, but my mom, when she, when she has uncomfortable emotions, she giggles. She laughs and she giggles. So her eyes were glassy and she was smiling and she's laughing. And I thought, okay, there's, she's, you know, there's a lot she's processing. I mean, she's certainly, certainly super proud of me and like big hugs all around. Um, but we haven't, we haven't actually gone into any kind of deep dive of, of her feelings about the film. Um, you know, I spoke earlier about emotional repression being a very big thing in my community. So I, I, haven't, I haven't wanted to push her. It, she saw it once. Um, when, it, when, there's, when there's time to sort of see it again, I'm gonna gently ask, you know, I wanna, I wanna dig in a little more and, and gen gently ask, um, but unfortunately I don't have, I don't have a, a more in-depth answer for that one just yet. That's all right. Those, so, those... And, and it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot for my sister and my mom to, it's a lot for I think my whole community to really relive those very specific uh, situations. And so, yeah, but they were all, I mean, they were all really proud um, and excited but I think more conversations still need to be had. Absolutely, and it's gonna be really interesting to, um, I think to share the film, of course, with, with your community um, coming up. And uh, how about the audience reaction? I mean, we now had the world premiere at TIFF. Uh, so you had two live socially distant screenings uh, in person. Um, I, one, I mean, was it amazing to be in a cinema again? And two, I mean, what was the audience reaction? Uh, like for you? So it was one, let me just say it was so weird. Um, we were only allowed 50 people per cinema because of social distancing rules. So to walk out on stage to introduce the film and it's virtually empty, it, it, it's, it's, it's so strange. And, you know, I think every filmmaker, we dream of that moment of just all those hearts and minds in the seat, like um, ours for the taking for the next hour and a half. And uh, so, so the way I, I framed it for myself was that this was a very, this was a very VIP screening. And these were 50 very, very important people. Um, but, but with only 50 people, feeling the audience, is something that didn't happen and it's something I love so much. It's my favorite moment to watch, to watch my work with a live audience and feel, feel when they, when they laugh, when they're angry, when there's tension. I mean, you can feel it in the air. And, and is, is it happening when I wanted it to happen? You know, are they going where I want them to go? That's, the best, best feeling. So here I was sitting with my husband and like the next person next to me was like 20, 20 chairs in that way. And then 20 chairs in that way. And I was like, I cannot feel anything. But it was like a very private screening with me and my husband in our little two seats with this giant, giant screen as it's meant to be seen. And the sound system was amazing and you could feel everything in your bones. So for me, the screening was fabulous. 
um, we had a lovely Q and A afterwards, and and those that did come did either engage in in questions or just express, you know, how much they they how how impacted they were, how upset they were, how happy they were, how they didn't know, and they were they were so happy to be there. Um, so very very positive experience for the the two live screenings and. Um, Beans was available for digital rental starting yesterday at six o'clock up until today at six o'clock was like the window that people ar around the country could watch it. And uh, again, the only way for me to hear feedback with that screening is through social media. So I have been seeing tweets. I, I, I'm generally not really on social media, but because of this festival, I'm like on it all the time because I want to see feedback. Um, and the feedback has been really amazing, really amazing. I mean, my heart is so full that the film is having an impact on, on viewers. I've yeah. been hearing nothing but amazing things too. And it's one of these films that I really want my, my mom and my family to see as well too. I always make sure that they see certain films and this is definitely one of those. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit, Tracy, and talk about, I mean, again, as a director, um, and certainly, I mean, you're, you're going back to a time that was very significant for you, very, very complex for you. But added to that, it was also, I mean, of course, a period film. It was it challenging making a period picture for the first time in your career? Yes. It was definitely challenging, um, especially, you know, we, we had, I'm really pleased. We did have like a very good budget, but a period picture is expensive. And the, 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 the plan was already grand. So in order to make it possible, we really, we had to find locations that hadn't changed in 30 years. So my locations team, they were amazing. And they just scoured the city and also the reserve to find homes that, you know, had not gone through the, the grand renovation already um, so that we could, take, we could take it back to its origins of the 90s. So we found one fabulous home where um, the, the, the woman who rented it to us, she grew up in that home. And so a lot of the features that she grew up around, she, they, the old kitchen had really, strong emotional ties for her. So she never gutted and renovated the kitchen, but, but of course improved the house. So it was this awesome mix of old and new um, style that she had, but the bones were all still there. So uh, I was so thrilled she lent us our, her house. We had to, I mean, of course, take all her stuff out and then bring it back to 1990 with the wallpaper, the bad furniture, you know? Um, and when she came into her, when she, she would visit, you know, every so often she'd come to visit and she was, I mean, she was like, what happened here? Like it was so drastically different. And, and we used the home I grew up in as the inspiration point. So I had, I went through all our albums and I grabbed all the photos from that time. So, you know, the sofa, the kitchen, it, it, it was all very much like the house I grew up in. And that was one thing when my mom, when we did speak a little afterwards, she was like, that kitchen, that was our kitchen. <laughs> so that was really cool. Um, and then all the, and all the other locations as well. We had to, we shot, we shot in them, the archdiocese on the South shore. Uh, lo and behold, they didn't see any need to renovate ever. <laughs> so, their lobby was still, you know, the or the burnt orange tiling, uh, the paneled walls, the desk, the the dinosaur desk. So that's how we were able to make this happen because we we did not have the budget to completely build these old these these period sets in a in a sense. The fashion was super fun. Um, it's all coming back. I mean, nineteen ninety the nineties are hot right now, apparently. So not only did they scour all of the um, secondhand stores for really authentic pieces, but they were also able to just purchase brand new pieces that 
were completely, you know, 90s fashion brought back to now. So that was really cool. That is really cool. And, you know, I love, uh, I mean, many things I love about this film. I get very excited when I see period narrative films um, by Indigenous filmmakers, because it's something that we rarely see. I mean, I've, been, I've seen mm. a lot of Indigenous made films over my 18 years as a programmer at Imaginative. And, you know, our presence on screen during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s in narrative films is exceptionally rare. So it was exciting to see uh, that come alive on screen too. And one of the ways that you also bring that time to life is through the use of archival footage throughout the film. So one, I want you to talk about that, but also two, talk about it in the sense of you really deliberately showed, um, made a point of showing a balanced or at times the opposite side from non-Indigenous Quebecois who supported the Mohawks during that time. Yes. So this film took about eight years for us to write. And for a number of those years in the beginning, we really were wrestling with, I mean, the Oka, the Oka crisis is just this massive event. And if people don't understand what and why and, and how, then how will they understand what the, the young character is going through? So we really wrestled with how much do we have to show and tell versus how much are we with um, beans? And draft after draft, it just wasn't working. And, and I, wasn't, I wasn't emotionally invested. You know, it was just so much, so, so much detail about the goings on of it. And the big breakthrough was when I finally realized that as a 12 year old, I didn't, I didn't know everything going on. I wasn't aware of why, why are these people throwing rocks at us? Why, why, you know, why are my, why are my parents home and they're not going anywhere? Why can't we drive our car anymore? There's no more gas. You know, I, I catch things, but I was very busy with my own, my own play schedule. You know, I mean, I was out having fun. So when I, when I realized that that is, that is the truth of this character is that she won't know everything. And if we're really going to experience it from her point of view, then the audience should be really be learning, um, learning these moments the way she would. However, the audience does need to know a certain amount of information to contextualize what she's going through. And that's when, you know, I hit upon, I mean, why, why not use all these archival images um, to really one place us, place us in the period and, and take care of a lot of the housekeeping that I need done. And, and also to make sure people understood that this really happened. So the one thing I didn't want was for audience members to, to go through something that makes them very uncomfortable and then to, to keep themselves safe, it's a very natural reaction, is to then say, oh, well, I'm sure that didn't really happen. I'm sure, I'm sure, she, I'm sure they're exaggerating. No, 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 honey, don't worry. That, there's, no way that there's no way that happened, come on. So I, that is the last thing that I wanted. So um, the archival footage did multiple things for us. Um, there was, what was the point? I think I lost the, uh, the gist of your question though. What was the gist of your question? Why? Oh, the balance, the balance, right. Um, <clears throat> so I did not just, just like, just the way the media vilified us that summer, I did not want to make their same grave mistake by vilifying everyone on the outside because that is not, that was not the truth. And, and that, that kind of dichotomous storytelling is dangerous. So, so it was, it was a very, from the very beginning, it was important to me that, that all of those, all of those nuances on the outside be represented. And so we do have the very, very ugly, violent, racist, horrible, people um we have we have cops who are we have cops who 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 are different stages some are sympathetic some are not <laughs> um the army as well you know 
Um, and then specifically in those, in those moments, um, I wanted to recognize the allies we did have, because ultimately, like I said, the whole goal of the movie is to really build more allies. So it, it was important. The support we had that summer, it was important. And, and it's the support we need now as well. Absolutely. That's amazing. You know, it makes me wonder um, if or, or how your experience as a documentary filmmaker informed your usage or how you used the archival footage in, in Beans. Did it? I, I, I mean, I think it did. You know, for the longest time, if, even if you read the script, in the script, it's maybe a half a page. It says archival moment. And then there's a few lines and some made up dialogue just so the reader gets the gist of like, you know, you're gonna learn that the army is attacking. The, the army is being rolled in in this sequence. But there wasn't a lot of information. And I, I, think, I think the entire, everyone on the entire team wasn't certain about those moments. You know, and a lot of the notes we were getting were mm, not sure if you need it in script form. Uh, I'm not sure if you need it. I think it might take you out of the story and um, people weren't quite sure. And, and here's the other thing, I know that footage. Uh, it's been in some of my other documentaries. Of course, I've seen all of the films made. Um, I, I lived at that time period. I know the footage that's out there. And so I always knew that these, these four benchmarks, there was almost five. Um, but it was in it was an edit that we dropped it down to only four because the four gave me everything I needed. But I always knew how much we could accomplish in those moments and that they would all have their own thematic um, drive and not just be about delivering some information. I mean, I think that's that's what a lot of people when it was in script form were like, well, it might it might be it might be a bit boring. Um, and I said, no, 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 no. As a documentarian, no, no, don't say that. Don't say that about archival footage. That is a big no, no. It's gonna be amazing. Um, and, and then I packaged it and they were all like, oh my God, that was great, that's perfect. So yes, I always had great confidence in those moments. I agree, it was used really effectively, really beautifully, and it's, it's, it's the right sort of thread, and you're right, the right connection to a factual truth, um, which for us is very often swept aside um, from there, which is wonderful. You know, you and your cohort in our community, a lot of you are writer-director combos, writer-director-producers often too. So, I mean, when you want to make more about, you, you know, your writing of the script, um, and there's a question that will come to you in regards to uh, the script itself in a second, but when you're writing as a director, um, I mean, clearly the two are inseparable to some degree, um, but do you feel I'm curious about your writing process as someone who also directs and how your sensibilities mm -hmm. as a director, knowing what you can achieve in that role affects your writing. Good question. These are all brand new questions. Oh, I love it. Good. Yeah. So I'm, uh, okay. So I have definitely been exposed to the writings of writers, you know, with Mohawk Girls, uh, worked with writers, Anderson E worked with writers. And so I do find that my writing is a little more um, Spartan because I know what it's going to look, I, I know what it's going to look like, or I know what I plan to do there. So I don't, I don't, sometimes I'm a little sparse in regards to the description of it, in, in regards to the poetry of it. And, and I say that because I've, I've read the scripts of my fellow writers on these two shows and just, I'm like swept away when I read these scripts and it's, you know, it's painting pictures in my mind and it's so beautiful and poetic. And, and I think, oh my God, I'm a terrible writer. Um, but <laughs> when I read my writing, I mean, the pictures are already there. And I think that's the thing is like when I do write and it's something I'm going to do. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're the benchmarks that, and the picture is in my brain. So it's, it's, I give enough that people will follow it, but I don't know that. Yeah. 
I've worked, I've, I've, I've worked with such incredible writers that I do aspire to be, to be like, you know, to, to be able to, um, have that same kind of, you know, everybody's, everybody's affected by the film. It's that kind of same, I'd love it if people could read the scripts and have that same like sense of, wow, that I feel reading other people's work. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean, absolutely. Um, and how about writing the dialogue, especially for the young children in there? There's a, a question that came through about how you manage to write the kids' dialogue so naturally. Um, and maybe you, that could be a segue into that lovely scene that we have another clip to show. Uh, again, that I mm. feel may be based on an actual interaction you might have had, or at least you might have experienced when you were a teenager uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I really, I, that the question is thrilling to me that the, the implication is that the dialogue is great and, and realistic. So thank you. Um, I, I mean, for the kids, I know I really just had to go back in my memory um, and remember the neighborhood and remember the way I, you know, the way I interacted and the way I speak, I spoke versus um, the tough girl down the street who I really tried to avoid as much as possible because man, she scared the hell out of me. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, there's a moment in the script when she's in the mirror. And I think we probably all had these moments where I, 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 you know, I would practice trying to be tough like that girl um, and man, I, I was not effective. Um, so yeah, it was just about remembering and my cousin, you know, my cousins also inspired me like very, very specific scenes, parties that I went to with my older cousins. And um, so yeah, I just drew upon that. And, and also, here's another thing I will say, that if you read the script versus seeing the film, you'll see that a lot of dialogue is missing so when you get to post it when you get to post is really when you get to write again and start pulling away pieces that are um ex they're they're too they're too expositiony or 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 even the actor you can see it in their performance that that was one line that they didn't really feel and now that you're seeing it, like you don't feel it either. Like that, that should have, you could have deleted that from the script, but you don't catch all of this at script phase. Um, and that's why edit is so amazing. Um, so if you watched everything we shot for some of these scenes, um, you may not be saying that. <laughs> you may not be saying like, wow, it was so naturalistic. Edit, edit and pulling away. And, and often, what you don't, what you, what you can't have on a page, you get when you're shooting. And that is all the reactions and all the subtleties of the actors interacting with each other. And often that says a lot more than any words can. So I, I think, I think going forward, that is definitely something I'm going to apply is, is even at script phase is to pull out more dialogue and replace it with a look or a contemplation type of moment instead to just let the actors do what they do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be my answer. I the love moment. the editing process. I love post. It's, it's an amazing time. Oh, um, God. Do you know what? I love, I love the scene where she swears for the first time so much. Uh, you know, and I watched it, one of the early cuts of the film too. Loved it, laughed then loved it, laughed harder when I saw it in, in the <laughs> final cut, because I remember, probably many people do, I remember the very first time I swore, and it was nowhere near as cool as it was for her, even if she was a little, um, if it was a little funny, but she did it, yeah, it was, it was um, not a proud moment, but certainly very funny to remember. So um, let's set up the second clip, uh, Tracy, um, okay. and I'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. So you are about to see a scene now further into the movie. Beans has now gone through a number of very traumatic events and she is really struggling with how to process all of that. She ends up lashing out herself and 
almost gets in some really very big trouble and her mother is very, very upset with her. Roll it. They were this close to calling the cops. You want to go to juvie? Hmm? Instead of Queen Heights? She started it. I'm sorry, what? Do you understand what is at stake here? If they hate us, we suffer. Our people suffer. And tonight you made more people hate us. And rightfully so. You behaved just as badly as they did. She deserved it. They all do. Oh, don't you scream at me. That is not how I raised you. You are better than this. We are better than this. Pack your stuff so we can get the hell out of here before they change their minds and they lock you up. I'm not going to that stupid school either. Fuck white people. Again, really powerful emotional scene. Tracy, did, how many takes did that um, take? So here's a nice little secret for everybody out there. Every scene did not take many takes. Um, the actors were so on point for one, thank goodness, because we also did not have the time. So it's really, a, it's a miracle that we have the film that we have and it really rests all on the talent. They all came totally prepared. And for that scene in particular, uh, we found this really, we found a motel about an hour outside of Ganawage. Again, never been renovated. So it was, it was such a strange place. Um, and, but the kids loved it. The kids thought it was so cool. Like they were stepping back in time. Um, and so, you know, moments before that scene, the kids are hanging out, they're having fun, they're laughing. And then it's time. And then just like that, Gaudio was in that state. Um, we got the scene and then just like that, we're bouncing around and like laughing again. So I, it's incredible. I mean, the, the, the anger and on her face. I mean, and this, this young woman is, um, she is the shining light of just joy. So it was such a transformation for that scene. And uh, both of them, both of them supported each other so well. And were, were, were the bond between the, those two actresses was just incredible. Um, and uh, they fed off each other perfectly. So they each, they each would have only had a few takes. We got a few sizes and we had it. That's amazing. I think, I think that probably speaks to their passion to really do justice to the story that you're putting forward. So that's incredible to know. Uh, also to all the viewers to please, uh, if you have any questions, enter them in the Q&A um, box or button at the bottom. Um, Tracy, I'm always curious as to how much of the film was shot chronologically or were you- Oh God, none of it. None of it, okay. None of it. I mean, early on we did look at it was a question of do we shoot it chronologically in order to help the actress like yeah. go through the journey emotionally, right? But when we looked at all of the logistics, we were really moving to a different site almost every day. Some days we, like the motel, we had three days at that motel. There was some sets where we were, we were there for a few days, but mostly over 31 days, we were always moving. So an end, you know, when we're in their home, there's scenes at the beginning of the film in their home, in the middle of the film, and at the end of the film. So to shoot and then leave and then come back and then leave, it just didn't make logistical sense and would really eat into the very valuable time we have to shoot the scenes. So it was, it was all over the place. Um, the rocks, the rocks at Whiskey Trench, the, when the mob attacks the cars, there was a few, there was a few things I did need. So that scene I wanted further down the schedule so that the kids had some confidence um, with the work 
the crew had really gelled. Um, I felt grounded um, in my own work to be able to kind of take on that scene. So that was one we made sure was was later in the schedule. Um, there was a few, there was a few like that, that just stipulation wise, um, you know, there's, there are two intimate scenes between, between the two actors, between Gaudio and uh, the, the young teenage boy. And I, I mean, I don't know how many spoilers to give away here, but um, one is, one is a sweet interact, sweet interaction, sweet. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is, is very much not. So it was important that we shot the, the sweeter one first before going to that other one. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can remember any other stipulations, hmm. but it was, it was all over the place. The schedule was all over the place. And uh, in fact, a... oh, I have a fun fact for you. Ooh, yes. So, yes. So it's, it's, actually quite impossible to get a provincial bridge to shut down for filming. Um, we found that out at every level that we tried to get permission to shoot on the Mercier Bridge. And we were two weeks out to shoot and we still didn't have a bridge. And I was being given like orders to start reimagining those scenes on an overpass using a green screen to like and then we'll in post we'll make it a bridge and i was like no that is so not going to work that is that is no so they were like well we need to do something and i said get me the bridge that's what we need to do um so nice fun fact is the um, the renovations on the Merc the mercy bridge cuts right through gunawage our land was expropriated to build it because nobody else wanted a bridge on their land. So they just took ours and built this big provincial bridge. Um, over the years, there's a conglomerate of companies in Ganawage that are contracted to do repairs on that bridge because we are a community of iron workers. Yeah. So we, so um, within my locations team, um, we had a, a, a woman, her name is Sasha Deer. Uh, she is a distant cousin of mine. Cousins. It all comes back down to cousins. So her father-in-law works for this conglomerate. And she was expressing to him, you know, the, tr the trouble that they're having. And, and he mentioned that they were going to be doing some, some road work up there in two weeks' time. And they'd be closing almost half the span. And Maybe we should, you know, go to the big boss and see if uh, they'd be willing to have us up there with them. So that is what we did. And uh, the boss is actually somebody that was one of the stars of my early films when I was 12. Uh, she's, she's three years younger than me. So she was one of my early actresses. And uh, she, she said she granted us permission. So we had access to a very, very small piece of that bridge. And right next to us were massive um, uh, dump trucks and, you know, uh, what do you call the thing Jack that breaks up cement? Jackhammers and construction <laughs> on one end. On the span next to us was all the di di diverted traffic. So they're honking, they're revving, they're angry because they think we closed down the bridge for our, our film and they're now stuck in an hour and a half of traffic. So they're beeping through every shot. There was at one point, there was some racial slurs that were yelled to my Mohawk extras. So we're in the middle of a shot where they're all just hanging out on an empty bridge. And it's on a crane and it's looking great. And then in the middle of the shot, half the extras rush to the side of the bridge and start yelling. And I'm watching my screen going, wait, that we didn't say we would do that. What are they doing? You know, so I yell cut. And then I find out that a motorist was driving by and just started yelling terrible things to them. So they reacted. Yeah, no, it was a zoo. Now, fun fact, this is how we started the whole shoot. So we had to move up our production dates by three days in order to take advantage of this bridge being shut down for two days. Um, so, and, and I mean, were we ready? 
no, we weren't ready, but this was the window we had. And so my first day in the, on this movie was on a provincial bridge, meeting my team for the first time. And in order for us to have this bridge, we always had to have one lane open so that the dump trucks could get off the bridge with the, the load of, uh, of asphalt. So we had to plan how to shoot it so that we were always only on one side so a dump truck could always get by. Now, I will say that by the middle of the first day, all of the Mohawk ironwork construction workers uh, were all very supportive. And when they needed to come by, they, they would say like, no, 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 fin finish, it's okay. And they would, they would stand there with the dump truck and, and wait and we would get to finish our shot and then we would quickly move everything over so that the dump truck could go by. I'm telling you, this is how it all started. This was the first day. It was, it was a crazy That's way to start. unbelievable. It's incredible always how time can just fold in on itself <laughs> at these times. Yeah. And it's terrible that that happened. I mean, these race, racial slurs, I mean, it just shows you still yeah. how tense at times, um, uh, you know, or how present that, that the crisis is still really in people's minds at the time. Um, yeah. We're kind of I will, coming. I will oh. also. Oh. No, please go well, ahead. I just wanted to. I wanted to add another little story in that, you know, in, I think one or one of those scenes is, is the men storming the bridge and some of them have guns and, you know, they're storming the bridge to block it. Um, and we had, we had warned the we let the community know that we're shooting, we're going to be shooting on the bridge. This is what's happening. Um, all of, all of the local communities nearby had known, but the motorists stuck in traffic seeing these men with guns and and of course the bridge is blocked because of it's because of construction but they didn't know that anyway there was a ton of calls to local police stations saying the mohawks are blocking the bridge again now we had already um, talked to all these police we had already talked to all these people so all the police officers were they were all able to say no no it's a movie we know everything's fine relax yeah mm. so what a what a first two days what a first two days that's incredible um we've had a few questions uh some of which have been um already answered or addressed in different ways i have to say that there has been unanimous praise and, and congratulations to you, tracy for a beautiful powerful film from lynn fernie from amy lee um, and from ali kazimi who asks you tracy he just wants to say that he's deeply moved by the film beautiful deeply humanistic. One of the haunting scenes in the film is the scene in the grocery store, just so layered and complex uh, and experiencing it from a child's perspective makes it even more terrifying and poignant. Um, could you speak about that scene and if it comes from a personal experience? Sure, so my, my personal experience with that type of scene would have been after the Oka crisis actually. So. Uh, the Oka crisis was over and we didn't have, you know, we have small stores on the reserve, but we always, we always went off reserve for all the different things we needed. And after the Oka crisis, there were many stores that um, had signs up that said Indians not welcome. So there were stores that we were not allowed in. And those that didn't have signs up, um, my mother was always very nervous. And, and once we went in with her and there was a hostile situation situation. So she, after that, she ended up leaving us in the car um, and she went in to get it. So I always, I always, I always was very anxious and very nervous when it came time to go shopping. And uh, that, that's, that's what I drew from for that scene. But those those situations did actually happen during the Oka crisis, um, as you even saw in the archival footage. Well, I mean, and it's a it's a great. I mean, that was thirty years ago, but we 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 have to make the point that we still see these things today. I've seen sadly many times on Facebook uh, people posting signs of shops around the country saying no natives allowed. Um, oh and my God. This still happens today. Um, yeah. Tracy, and how well, is how is that not a hate crime? It is. I mean, this is the thing. It absolutely How, is. Are they being like? Are they being prosecuted? Please. Exactly. Can there that. be consequences? Please. And again, I, I hope your film um, changes things, like all 
uh, our, our films do, I believe. Um, we're nearing the end. Tracy, I want to ask you uh, your thoughts or, or your contemplations on, I think, really what you're doing and, again, what your peers are doing collectively. Um, you know, one of the most powerful things for me leading up to Imaginative's 20th anniversary last October, in thinking of, you know, it, what we do for the 20th anniversary in about 2017, um, you know, was really contemplating the types of activities that we do. And it struck me that, you know, Imaginative at 20 really reflected 20 years of programming of indigenous made film and video works. And that was so profound to me because for the first time, not just in our cultural histories, but it was the first time in cinematic history that we would be able to look back to such a depth and speak, again, to a depth and breadth about indigenous national cinemas. And so, I mean, your work, right from the first work that you did, Mohawk Girls, to Club Native, to the Mohawk Girls series, to, to, to this film, I mean, really contributing to Mohawk national cinema and Mohawk screen culture. And I mean, it's, it's exciting. And so like, as we're That's sort of nearing the end, reflect on that. But to me, I think it's reflecting in a way that sort of sets up what's to come. So that's so big. <laughs> um, I I feel so honored to be where I am and to have been able to do what I have done. Um, I never thought I would be able to tell stories about my own people, about things that matter to me things that come directly from my heart and so to have been able to do that for the last 20 years is just massive from just for myself um but to hear you contextualize it in the way you just did it's um incredibly humbling and it's a massive responsibility that we all have and, and, and I go back to the story you told about these four young, young men that you met, um, you know, to, to think that we, we, have, we have paved that road for the ones to come next to then rise to an entirely new, like an entirely other level than when we, when we started. I mean, we, we have been finding our way. And I remember at the very beginning of my career, even before uh, Mohawk Girls, it was a co-direction with Neil Diamond on a film called One More River. And the first screening I was gonna have of that film, uh, an indigenous elder came up to me um, and he was kind of gruff. And he was like, so you're, you're the director? I said, and you know, I'm like 22. I'm like, mm hmm And he's like, and are you, are you an indigenous storyteller? And I kind of looked at him and I'm like, well, I'm Mohawk and I told this story. So in that way, yes. But if there's a specific definition of what it means to, to be an indigenous storyteller, I'm not sure what I can tell you. I, I, cause I don't know what that definition is. And you know, he like gave me a little side eye and he's like, okay, we'll see. And then off he went into the theater and I thought, oh my God, um, what if I, what if I'm not? What if I, you know, what if I didn't do it right? What if, yeah, <laughs> afterwards, after the screening, the same gentleman came back up to me and, uh, and he said, oh yeah, you're an indigenous storyteller. He's like, there, you, you went where you needed to go you didn't focus on one straight line. You didn't focus on any rules. You went where the story needed to go. And that is an indigenous storyteller. Um, and yeah, I, I always remember that moment. Um, How beautiful to bring him into this moment uh, at this time. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a lovely way. Tracy, we have so much we could talk about, including what's coming next. Mm. But we should wrap it up and let's uh, get Hans back into the fold here, but I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for your time. 
uh, here. I mean, these platforms, the DGC Hunt, the Visionary Series, I mean, we had uh, Michelle Latimer, Sonia Bolo, Loretta Todd is coming up on Friday. Uh, a tremendous opportunity to really showcase some phenomenal storytellers from our community. So thank you again for the opportunity. Well, and thank you. Thank you Jason. I mean, what an incredible conversation, uh, Jason and Tracy, really so heartfelt and so important. Uh, the stories you're telling, the stories you're talking about, the history. Uh, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And, and, and I'm sure I'm, I'm uh, echoing everything the viewers are thinking uh, and saying thank you and, and, and the best of luck in getting this film uh, seen by so many people uh, that should be seeing it. And, and clearly it is. I mean, it is getting out. It's getting the buzz it should be getting. It's, it's a beautiful piece of work. So thank you so much. Um, on Friday night, as Jason mentioned, uh, tune in for an in-depth conversation with filmmaker Loretta Todd. Uh, in, in conversation with Executive Director of the Indigenous Screen Office, Jesse Wente, talking about her groundbreaking film, Monkey Beach, playing at TIFF, uh, and is also the opening night film at VIF, which is absolutely fantastic. Find the links to those and all upcoming sessions at tgc.ca slash visionaries2020. We'll also be sending out specific invitations uh, on each day that we're doing these. It's gonna be fantastic. Um, Tracy, Jason, what can I say? I mean, amazing. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing these thoughts and, and stories. All the best with the film, Tracy. Thank you so much. This has been such a joy. Jason, always, always a pleasure. Hans, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. Thank you for watching the film. Please spread the word. Good night.